loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it. And I'm thinking, no, I don't have any oxes or donkeys, Lord. I can't relate. Did you feed and water your dog on the Sabbath? Like, you will do the things necessary to take care of your animals. How much more will God take care of his children? Like, if you... It's, Jesus is teaching the same way he's always taught. If you, being evil, can take care of your pets, how much more the father taking care of his children? If you know how to take care of animals, wouldn't it make sense that God would take care of his child? And even more so, and we're fools, we're sinners, we're evil, and we do good to animals. How much more love does God have for his children than we do for our animals? That's the comparison he's making. God is good. He's literally telling us, listen, God is good. You guys take care of beasts. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, that, that title, that title, Daughter of Abraham, that right there is a huge key and secret to understanding Jesus' understanding and his teaching of the way God treats us. To call her a daughter of Abraham elicits one thought, promise. When the children of Abraham are mentioned in Scripture, it's always with the mention of the promise of God. Because remember, Abraham didn't have children. He couldn't have children. His wife couldn't have children. And God gave him a word. He gave him a promise that you're going to have a child of your own body. A miracle child. Your wife is going to give birth. And it'll be your seed. He wasn't supposed to have kids, but the promise of God went against our physical understanding of the world, that God is able to do above what we think in this universe. So when he calls her a daughter of Abraham, she's a miracle baby. She's a promised child. That this daughter who, who I have healed, there are promises of God that God will fulfill that are impossible for us to understand. Should, so should she not be set free this day? God gave a promise. God is good. Our understanding of God, if it is boiled down to the following and keeping of rules, we have not understood our God properly. He's a good God. He's our Father the, the, the idol that we have raised up as human beings, this is the idol we've raised up as human beings. Human beings have created a God in their own mind. It's the idea of the tyrant and all his slaves. And we must obey this tyrant in the sky or he'll burn us with hellfire. And the picture that Jesus paints of the Father is not a tyrant king who rules over us with the iron fist and makes us keep rules. He's a loving father who wants to set his children free from their diseases, free from their burdens, set us free from our sins, ultimately setting us free from death itself. Now we know in the scripture, according to the book of Genesis, that the curse upon the earth for death, sickness, disease, even the thorns and thistles that grow up from the ground are a curse from God because of sin. And who is the perpetrator? Who is the deceiver that tempted us into sin? It is Satan, that old serpent, that old dragon. And he's mentioned here. Satan is the one who binds people through sin. Now, I'm not saying that she did some sin and is what caused her to be bound. The fact that she's a human being, she's subject to it. We're all subject to it because we're born as humans. We're born as children of Adam first, as children of the flesh. Satan has used that to bind people, sin and evil and wickedness. And I have to tell you right now, you want to be set free, there might be some doors you need to close. 
There are some people in their families, they're, they're going through curses that come from the enemy because they've opened the door to Satan through sin. That's why it's so important for you to repent from your sin. If you have sin in your life, do something about it. With the power and grace of God, do something about it. Listen, young men, if you have a problem with pornography, don't be on the computer alone. I'm being real. You want to get set free from some stuff? <sighs> I had a buddy who had an issue, and uh, the way he solved it is he told his wife, if you're a married man, you struggle with pornography, tell your wife. And you know what? The first initial reaction to that, most men would be like, that's the last person I want to tell. She's actually the first person because she's a part of you. She will help you with that issue, guaranteed. It won't be a pleasant conversation, I'll tell you that right now. But what happened to the men that had guts to just own up to their mistakes? Have some backbone. Confess your faults to one another so you can be healed, the scripture says. We read that in James, and we always think it's about somebody else. You want healing in your home? Be honest with one another. I'm not saying that's going to be easy, but I'm telling you, the best disinfectant is light. Bring it out into the open. Should be no secrets between husbands and wives. Now, if you're not married, this might be a little foreign to you, but if you're married in covenant with a woman, a man. Your spouse is your partner in this life, there to help you. And the best way to get through your issues is open honesty with each other. That doesn't mean you be a jerk. Well, I'm being honest, so I'll just tell you exactly what I think. No, that's, that's not what I mean. Because you can be honest without being a jerk about it. You dig what I'm saying? To be open and honest with one another. You only got one life. You might as well be honest and be who you really are with your spouse. If anybody in the world be honest with your spouse, listen, I know you gotta put on a smile and a happy face when you go to work. You gotta make sure your supervisor's cool with you. I understand that. But when you get home, be honest with your spouse. That way you guys can grow together like the real you can grow together. Sorry, I'm preaching now. Uh, Eighteen years. Jesus uses the word again. Should not this woman, so ought not this woman be loosed? That's what he said to her. Look at this phrase. Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He laid hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. You are loosed from your infirmity. It's past tense. You notice that. Like you learn in English early on, the, the ED at the end of most verbs means it's past tense. Then it says, and he laid hands on her after. You see the order of events here? This is another revealing of the nature of God eternal. It's his eternal nature of what Jesus is revealing. He said, woman, you are loosed. It's already happened. And then he lays hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Sometimes we think when God does miracles that God is somehow pushing forward into the future a new reality. Like, she's been bound, and so now God's created this new reality that she's loose, and now she'll go from there. That's not what the Lord does when he does miracles. What the Lord is actually doing is he's restoring her back to the original purpose and design God had for her in the beginning. You are loosed. And this is manifesting in real time. You are loosed. The eternal truth about Jesus Christ is this. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
before God ever made the world, at its foundation, Christ was already slain. It was already in his mind, in his character, in his nature to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin and not a single person walked the earth yet because there wasn't an earth yet. That the truth of Jesus Christ is eternal and it has always been eternal. We're just now stepping into something that has always been. This is how the scriptures can say, Paul says this in the book of Ephesians, you are seated Past tense. You, in some uh, translations, I believe it's the NIV, you have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. I'm sitting here in a pew in Bible Christian Church in Ark City, Kansas. What do you mean I'm seated in heaven? I thought that that was supposed to happen in the future. Paul says you have been seated in Christ. That, that his plan is already done. We're just walking it out. We're experiencing it in real time. But it's already done. It's already done. That's what amen literally means. So be it. It is done. Isn't that what Jesus cried out from the cross? It is finished. It is accomplished. It is done. Amen. Do you ever wonder? (laughs) Do you ever wonder how John could speak of the revelation of the apocalypse? And when he speaks of it, go back and read the book of Revelation. He speaks a lot about what's happening in past tense, like it's already happened. That was written almost 2,000 years ago, like it was already written. He already saw it happen. How could John see something happening 2,000 years ago that we're sitting here saying, well, it hasn't happened yet? We experience time. God is eternal. God is eternal. So when he says to this woman, you are loosed, he's basically saying, let me tell you who you really are. Let me tell you who you really are. You are loosed. You are free in Christ. (sighs) Amen. Let me read this passage here. Got a couple scriptures and then I'll let you go. It says there in verse 17, when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. When Jesus does a work, people rejoice. Because all that he does is glorious. All that he does is amazing. Because Jesus is amazing. I want you to look at Isaiah 53. We're going to take a little turn in our thinking. But Isaiah 53, look at this. Isaiah, written estimated between seven and 800 years before the time of Christ. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 53, surely, certainly, truthfully, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Anybody notice the tense of the verbs that are used by the prophet? They're all past. He has borne. Not he is buried. He has borne. Jesus hadn't even been born in Bethlehem yet. And the prophet is speaking about what he's going to do as if he's already done it. I love how Jesus reveals the nature of God to us. It's in simple language that all that God is and all that he has done, it's already like, (laughs) it's already done in his mind. That's how confident God is about what he does. There's no sweat. There's no worry like, 
Well, I hope this works. We do that. We make plans. We have ideas that, okay, if I do this, maybe. You know, I know if I do it right, this is what we're going to have when we're finished. We make plans. That's fine. Plans, plans sometimes don't turn out the way we think they should. Writer of the Proverbs say that a man plans his way, but it is the Lord that directs his steps. It doesn't mean that planning is bad. But no, compared to him, our plans, whoo, let the Lord direct your steps. Make plans, but let the Lord direct your steps. Because when he has a plan, it's already done. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. It's already done. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Some translations render this passage, by his stripes, we were healed. Matthew says Jesus fulfilled this prophecy of Isaiah. Look at Matthew chapter 8. Now, because of the translation from Greek, Isaiah, <clears throat> obviously written in Hebrew, but you have uh, the Gospel of Matthew written in Greek. So a few words are a little bit different, but he's quoting from the passage from Isaiah. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him, him being Jesus, they brought to Jesus many who were demon-possessed. And Jesus cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. When the Greek rendering is given for this passage, the translation turns from griefs to infirmities, and sorrows are changed to sicknesses. And it's not that they're changed, he, the, 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 the Greek writer, uh, uh, Matthew's not changing the words from the Hebrew into something different. He's giving a, a Greek word that's translated to English, which is the same word for both of these. So sorrows and infirmities are the same thing. The sicknesses, the griefs, are the griefs and the infirmities are the same thing. The sorrows and sicknesses, it's the exact same word. They could be used for the same thing. In other words, like, the sorrows of the heart. You ever, you ever had sorrow in your heart? That You use this phrase, I felt sick in my heart. That's why you could use that is because those words are interchangeable. So Matthew quotes it here, and he says that Jesus healing people physically is a fulfillment of what Isaiah said centuries earlier. Jesus carried our sicknesses and our sins Remember what I said before? They're tied together. Sickness and death is tied to sin. The reason we get sick and die is because of sin. Scriptures make that clear. The scriptures talk about sin entering the world and death with it. <clears throat> Jesus sets us free from our sickness. Jesus sets us free from our sins. Now, this doesn't mean that every time you pray in Jesus' name that Jesus is going to heal who you ask him to heal. Sometimes he does. Now, there are many of us here that could raise our hand and say, hey, we prayed for this sickness, God took care of it. It's according to his will, when he wants to do it. But I am convinced of this. This is what I believe about the true healing of God, that every single sickness and disease in the world will be healed eventually. The scriptures say that when we are resurrected, there's no more sickness, there's no more death. So if God doesn't heal you now, know that in the resurrection there is a hope that all sickness will be wiped away. All death and disease will be gone. There will be no more sickness, the scriptures tell us. The prophecy is no more sickness, no more death, and that he will even wipe the tears away from our eyes. Praise the Lord for these prophecies. I'm looking forward to that day. 
Jesus will set us free. He has set us free. And he's going to continue to do so. And there's going to be an ultimate fulfillment of all these things. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, this is John chapter 8. And I'll finish up with this. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I love this. The truth shall make you free. Now, there are other translations that say the truth shall set you free. <clears throat> what I really love about this passage is how it ties in with so many other passages. Remember what Jesus was doing when he set that woman free? He was teaching in the synagogue. This woman was a disciple who was abiding while he taught his word. And then the truth, Jesus, set her free from her infirmity. There's another passage that talks about how Paul was teaching. And he looked at a man and he saw that he had faith to be healed while he was teaching. And maybe you got someone who's dealing with a sickness or disease. This is, I'm just throwing out something out there. I'm not giving a guarantee. But it might be something that you try. If you got someone dealing with a sickness, surround them with the word of God. Speak it to them. Teach it to them. Get them a little framed thing that has a scripture in it so that they can look at every day while they're sitting in their hospital bed. Give them a Bible. Or give them their Bible if they don't have it. Healing oftentimes comes through the word of God. Not because some preacher laid hands, not because somebody said something, but the word of God itself doing the healing. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We're not the ones that do the healing. We're not the ones doing the setting free. It's Jesus. It's the truth. He sets people free. Never forget that. Always know your place in the kingdom. We humble ourselves and understand he is the power. He is the one that does the work and submit ourselves to that. He says, then they answered him and said, we're Abraham's descendants. Remember what he said about that woman? It's a daughter of Abraham. Shouldn't she be set free? Shouldn't she be loosed on the Sabbath day? These people answer him, we are Abraham's descendants. We're Abraham's children. And we've never been in bondage to anyone. There's that word, bondage. See, there's, there's a, a game of connect the dot you can do through Scripture. And you find certain key words and phrases where these concepts are found closely together. He's revealing a truth to us. But notice, they're wrong. We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Uh, Egypt? Hello? Hello? As a matter of fact, Abraham was told his descendants would go into bondage in Egypt by God. So here's a guy that doesn't know the Lord's word. Not to mention Babylon, right? The Persians, right? All these people that brought them into bondage. We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Well, you haven't been abiding in God's word. So you're not his disciple, whoever said this. How can you say you'll be made free? Jesus answered, said, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. I, I, well, we knew it would happen. I, but I am so blown away by how many churches have tried to erase sin as though God doesn't talk about it. So many preachers that get popular talking about how good God is and they never mention to people that they should repent from their sin. I'm thinking, Wow. It's a major part of the message is that sin causes slavery, sin causes death. How can you even preach Jesus unless you talk about him carrying our sins, dying for our sins? But there's a, there's a church, I say it in quotes, a church culture that has arisen, especially in the West, that love to tell people all the good stuff about God, and they never mention the bad stuff about us. 
Now we should focus on God. God should be our main focus. We should focus on his nature, but we should know who we are before him, that we are sinners that need grace. We are sinners. We've done evil in his sight. We've broken his law, and it causes us to be slaves, and Jesus has set us free from that. That's when we rejoice. We rejoice because Christ died for us and set us free from our sins, set us free from the penalty of death, that we can live forever with him. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. You can't live forever in sin and being a slave. He says, a son abides forever. So what has God done with us? Instead of being slaves to sin, he's caused us to become children of God. That's the great promise. That's the great cry from the the apostle John. He writes in his letter to the church, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, for that is what we are. Children that abide forever. The gift that Kyle talked about, the gift of eternal life. A slave does not abide forever. They can't live forever in the house in sin. But Christ is taking care of our sin. He set us free, made us sons and daughters, and we can abide forever in the Father's house where there's many rooms and much joy and peace and pleasures forevermore, the scriptures teach us. Whoo, it's good news. Some of us forgot it's good news. Therefore, If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. You are loosed, church. He sets you free. We should rejoice in that and live in that. Turn from your sin. Repent from your wicked ways. Those dark things that you're keeping in the dark, bring them out into the light. Put them before the Lord. Lord, help me with this. Set me free. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Call out to him. We should be asking as a church, as we get closer and closer to that day, we should be asking, Lord, cleanse the church, cleanse my house, make us a people of God, make us holy, make me righteous, Lord. I want to walk in your statutes and your laws. I want to do according to your will. Obey your commandments and live a life that is truly life. There's a call for the church right now, more than ever, to live holy, to live according to God's word. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, You are my disciples indeed. That's what the the world needs. That's what Ark City needs. Ark City needs a bunch of disciples that walk in Jesus' word so that way he can set people free in this community. That's why he brought you here. He didn't bring us here to make us comfortable and cozy. He brought us here so we could be blessed. We could be blessed in this community. We could be blessed in our homes and our families, but he has a mission for us. It might be your granddaughter, getting her to turn to the Lord, be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Your mission might be that neighbor across the street who's miserable. He needs some peace, he needs some joy, and God might have put you in that neighborhood to share the gospel with that person. You don't have to save everybody, because here's the thing, you can't save anybody. Jesus does that. So we need to be sharing him with our words and with our lives, amen? Amen. Will you stand with me, free people of the church? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your scripture. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and grace. Pray, Lord, that you would bless your church now. Lord, be with all those who are not here with us traveling, uh, going on vacation, or those who are working, Lord. I pray that you be with them. I pray, Lord, that somehow that this word Uh, would get to them, that they would be encouraged in their spirits to continue to obey your word and follow you. Bless us here now, all those under the sound of my voice, Lord, I pray that your face would shine upon them, that you'd be gracious to them. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace. Bless us. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.